Mizbay uh, develops a cognitive assistant for engineering simulation called Guru. And, um, you know, to give you a little bit of an explanation of what we do, I'm going to tell you about a contract that we recently won from, from the Air Force. It's a, it's a phase two uh, SBIR contract. Um, the Air Force, just at the end of last year, announced a digital transformation they're going through where they have the goal of reducing the time it takes to design a new aerial platform, go from concept to flying prototype, like a, like a new fighter jet, down from a decade plus to a single year. So this is a, a transformation for them. And the way they said uh, that they intend to do it is by utilizing simulation in engineering at a scale that is unprecedented. Um, well, that's exactly what we focus on. We focus on the fact that there are thousands of simulation packages for engineering and yet each one takes months to years to learn how to use. Once you learn it, it still takes hours to set up one new simula simulation. So whether you're designing a jet or a car or even an air conditioner, you should be creating a virtual prototype on a computer. You should be running simulations of aerodynamics for performance, thermal to make sure you're not melting pieces inside of it, structural analysis to make sure that it's lightweight, manufacturable and, and uh, strong. But only about 1% of engineers do that because it takes so much training. Well, we built an autonomous system that learns that third-party simulation software for you so you can just start using it and concentrate on your design. That is how we say Guru owns the modeling and simulation tech stack like never before. So we focus on a very particular type of uh, hierarchical uh, artificial intelligence that enables our system to learn how to run this software and uh, set it up and orchestrate it for you. Um, and like I said, we use this system to set up laborious and complicated simulations for you. You know, the engineering simulation software business today is at, a, at about a $64 billion market size. It's pretty big, um, but that's only capturing about 1% of engineers. With our system, we intend to make it 100%. Uh, we have one contracts from the Air Force and Missile Defense Agency, and so also some commercial ones recently uh, in areas including um, engineering and design simulations, uh, also uh, trajectory simulation. For example, one customer for trajectories is the Missile Defense Agency. And we recently got into virtual world immersive training where we found out that uh, actually um, for all sorts of virtual training scenarios, it ends up being the same thing where setting up one new training scenario takes hours where they need it to take minutes. Uh, and so that's what where Guru comes in there. We developed this Universal Interface for Simulation, we have been selling pilot contracts uh, so far to organizations uh, like DOD uh, and some others. Um, we expect in about a year and a half that we will be able to transition from the pilot mode of go to market to, to a SaaS market uh, where we're actually giving access to the system online via cloud. We expect that while you know last year we did 0.8 million dollars uh, of revenue this year uh, we uh, will be doing at least three um, actually we're, we, we have about three to ten in the pipeline right now uh, that we're in the midst of closing we expect that uh, mid 2022 uh, we will start exiting pilot mode of go to market and uh, start selling SaaS licensing and we think that in about three and a half to five years we can get up to 100 million uh, ARR um, so, so far, uh, you know, in, in the, the short time that we've been in existence, the last uh, few years, we were one of 10 companies selected by the Air Force Accelerator powered by Techstars, went through that program last year. Uh, we started partnering with a series of uh, third-party software and cloud companies um, that uh, we've been training Guru to run uh, their services with. Um, and then we started winning contracts. So uh, we uh, have two uh, active phase two Air Force contracts with uh, several more in the pipeline right now. That gives you kind of a, a quick overview and we'd love to answer some questions. Yeah, absolutely. So it's super fascinating. I'd love to know a little bit about your background first because I, from what I do know of this space, uh, I guess pun intended there, is, uh -huh. it is it is not an easy space to get into not just because it's really technical and it's really complicated, but it's also a network driven space. And there's sort of this like, you know, everyone is um, incrementally improving on everyone else, 
But in order to really move the needle, you need someone who's like, I can, I can 10 X, whatever you're doing, which you've talked about. It's taking hours to minutes. So share a little bit about you yourself. So I, I uh, have been uh, working in uh, aerospace and energy for uh, more than 20 years. And my, my particular background is I've been using supercomputers to design new technologies. So um, I led uh, aerodynamics and configuration design and uh, computational physics on a series of programs that were funded by NASA, DARPA, uh, the, D the Department of Energy and, uh, and other organizations like that. Um, I used to work at a company called Mastin Space Systems where we were one of three prime contractors that were selected for DARPA's XS1 reusable space plane program. And um, we had uh, um, access to the Department of Defense's best supercomputers and we used it to uh, design and evolve a uh, reusable space launch uh, vehicle configuration that's never been done before. Um, we designed it on the supercomputers first before testing anything. And then we tested it at the end of the program and our testing results compared very well to our predictions and DARPA was thrilled with our, uh, our results. We did uh, in, in, a, in another company I, I used to work at called Ramgen Power Systems, we did something kind of similar, um, but in the area of uh, experimental high-speed high turbo machinery where again, uh, in that case, we were using Department of uh, Energy supercomputers uh, at the Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. Uh, we used uh, their premier super supercomputers at the time, uh, Jaguar and then Titan to uh, design and evolve our technology. And um, we achieved performance outcomes in our research and development that uh, ha had never been touched before. When you do that a certain number of times and you, you have been lucky enough to uh, so-called live in the future by having access to compute power like 10 years earlier than anybody else gets access to that kind of compute power, um, it enables you to, uh, to, to learn some things uh, that it takes to um, integrate all these kinds of things together and um, also enables you to test a lot of methodologies to figure out uh, on the artificial intelligence side, what are the right ingredients to uh, make an autonomous system like this. And uh, so it was extraordinary experience that uh, ultimately led to perceiving the need for this and then enabling us to figure out how to do it. What are like, what would be a considered a fair margin of error? So you're talking about the, you know, coming up close enough and DARPA was happy with what they saw. I'm, I'm just curious. This has nothing to do with your campaign. I'm just curious what sure. someone in your position sure. considers a fair margin of error. Extremely important question. So when you're simulating things as opposed to doing real world physical experiments, um, the, the upside is um, you can try brand new things. So for example, when you look at a transatlantic airliner that, you know, you, you fly to Europe on um, and you look at that airliner in the 60s, and then you look at the airliner, you know, that existed in the 70s, then the 80s, then the 90s, um, you line them up side by side, they all look very similar. Um, and it's, it's only relatively recently that you started seeing some very significant changes in those kinds of aircraft designs. And it, it, it's because when you have something that people's lives depend on, um, you cannot afford to make huge changes and then discover potential problems the, the wrong way. Yeah. Um, and uh, it is so expensive to design and test certain you know, options, even though they might you know, give you radically higher performance, it's so expensive that you end up just never doing it. Simulation enables you to try anything that you want, but yeah, your, your simulation better be accurate enough or, you know, it's, it's, it's useless. So first of all, you have to demonstrate that you're capturing the physics. And uh, so validation of computational physics simulations is, is a whole area and one that I've, uh, I've, I've published in for a couple of decades. Um, that's one of, one of the areas that I focused on because it's so important for this. You, you have to capture the fundamental physics. You have to demonstrate that. You have to capture the trends. So if my simulations are showing that this design change to this transonic compressor is giving me higher performance and giving me more margin before it surges, um, when I go and test that, that thing, when I actually build it and test it, I better see the same trends. I may uh, you know, have different absolute values of predicted efficiency, and pressure ratio, uh, but they better be close. And so, you know, you you may be single digit percentages off. You may be in some extreme cases more like ten percent off. If you're fifty percent off, if you're twenty percent off, you know, th there's something wrong. You should go back to the blackboard. And there, there's a, a, a series of ways that you can go back and uh, you can upgrade your model. But um, 
these days with the kind of com compute that we have, even on you know commercial cloud, you can run a series of studies of different levels of sophistication in your model that actually enables you to discover the po possible errors in your simulations to uh, improve them again without going to the expense of time and, and time of, of uh, having to go and physically test that. You want to do that at the end when you're as sure as possible, you really have a, a new compelling design. So fascinating. But just like the speed at which we innovate now is gotten to the point where a company like you needs to exist or there cannot be innovation because we're, we're it's almost like, I mean, this is such a you know, lame version of this, but it's almost like you know, a, a motorcycle stunt driver being able to practice a thousand times before they go and, you know, come up a hundred feet short, <laughs> like we're only we're right. dealing with rocket ships and it's just a different world altogether. Um, you're, you're right. You're so right. And like, you know, DOD is at the forefront. It's, it's just like, you know, ARPA, the original uh, version of, of what's known as DARPA were the first funding funders, uh, major funders of the internet. Uh, likewise, Air Force is at the forefront of digital engineering today. The, you know, the Air Force secretary recently said, uh, Secretary Barbara Barrett, she said, digital engineering isn't an option. It's essential. It's faster. It's cheaper. It's better. And the acquisition chief, uh, you know, just late last year said, um, wars will be won and lost based on how well we digitally design. So that's, that's yeah. how important they think that this is. I, I have no doubt. Uh, speaking of that and the importance, uh, let's slide over to your campaign currently. So everyone listening to this can invest in this company along with me and anybody else uh, by going to startengine.com slash M-S-B-A-I. Uh, I love how you, do. You, what did you call it? Mizba? What did you, how did you pronounce? Mizba. Mizba. That's a, that's a, I've never seen anyone actually take what looks like an acronym and then turn it into a real thing and then turn it into an acronym. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the actual campaign. Uh, you've got just shy of a thousand investors, about 17 days left. People, by the time you hear this, you've raised, you know, a decent chunk of, of change so far. You're trying to raise a million dollars ultimately. Uh, tell me a little bit about what the purpose of the raise is, why you chose to do it this way. Um, and just in general, how you plan on use this, using the proceeds. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, about 75% of uh, the funds uh, these days are going to uh, technology development and uh, the rest is going to uh, sales and marketing and uh, administration. So the reason that we did the the raise was that it, it made sense um, at the uh, the point of development that we were at uh, when, when we began this to uh, to start with equity crowdfunding before going to institutional investors who would want a board seat and uh, would want uh, a bigger chunk of the company. You know, we we care a lot about our our equity crowdfunding investors, and we think that we're going to bring them a ton of value. We think that the implications of the kinds of numbers and the size of market we're going after um, is, is something that should give them uh, you, you, you know. A, a good idea of uh, how encouraging the projections could be for them. Um, and, uh, and we're extremely appreciative of their uh, participation. We have started winning some pretty significant uh, contracts. Um, and um, so we are uh, doing extraordinarily well based on revenue. And uh, it's going to be a little bit of, uh, uh, more time until we start uh, approaching um, institutional. So equity crowdfunding really made sense at this point stage for us. Last question I've got before we roll out is, you know, basically I understand the concept of, of military contracts and obviously SaaS play is where the multiple comes in big time. Um, how do you view this company between that like pilot stage and the pro stage? Because it's, there's a certain, you know, very similar to how you describe the company itself with the simulation. There's almost a simulation going on here. Uh, and then when you go to scale, it is obviously quite different and the use cases are different. How do you view the impact of going from a very private to a more public availability product? And how does that impact bottom line? Almost all of the funds that have gone into uh, the technology development have gone into the central platform and learning engine for the system. So uh, the same interface that the missile defense agency is using is the one that the commercial customer will be using. Uh, we've very specifically architected it to be that way. And um, it's the same learning engine that learns how to run the software as well. You know, here, here's, here's a very quick quote from uh, the just May 2021 from the White House, from their uh, America Jobs Plan. They said, despite pioneering the technology, the United States is behind the, the race to manufacture electric vehicles. It is time for the U.S. to lead in EV manufacturing, infrastructure deployment, and innovation. 
we uh, are already starting to work with American automotive manufacturers to bring the exact same capabilities that we have been building for the Air Force's digital transformation to enable them to reduce the time uh, to prototype of new fighter jets to radically scale up engineering for electric vehicles. Immense uh, opportunity here with the exact same system that we started developing for DOD. That's super helpful because I, I feel like if you're listening to this, you're, you're wondering, okay, it's like, one is a rocket ship and or, uh, you know, an airplane right. or something. In the, like, how else does it work? And, and the reality is, in you know, the one thing I want people to remember is that this is a modeling company. This is an AI for modeling. Modeling can be used for any number of things. And we haven't even exactly. talked about drones and all the other stuff that, that will be a result of net result of this. So um, that's right. Uh, Alan, I, I appreciate you taking the time. Uh, where do people Thank go you, to learn more about you and, and, uh, and the company? Startengine.com slash MSBAI M-S-B-A-I is a good place or our website you can get to by just typing msb.ai into your browser.